it's a it's a solution to the problem that seven and a half billion people have on the planet. Oh yeah, and by the way, it'll make us billions of dollars. Just because you can do a thing, doesn't mean you should do a thing. If you're a crypto anarchist and you hate everything about the world, my advice to you would be make Bitcoin successful, make it worth $250 trillion, and your Bitcoins that you bought for a dollar will make you richer than Jeff Bezos. And when you have $200 billion of your own money, then you can go and found your own country and you can be a crypto anarchist or go to Mars and declare, you can do whatever you're going to do. But first, get the money. <laughs> mm -hmm. First, be successful at the one thing you can be successful. And I, and I think that that's, that's the, the lesson I learned. Uh, there are a lot of people much more successful than me in business, obviously, right? <laughs> Amazon, Apple, Facebook, Google. Like, it's not hard to figure out who they are. They're on the front page, right? And, uh, and more power to them. I think that... Um, that my experience has just given me an appreciation for focus, humility, and harmony. And when you have a good thing, like, like don't screw it up. And if there's a, if there's a biological metaphor for you, it's a chambered Nautilus. If you look at a chambered Nautilus, it, it's, it's nature's solution to growth under pressure. It starts small, and then it wraps around itself. It builds a shell twice as big, twice as big again, twice as big. And geometrically, it creates this golden triangle or golden mean. Um, and it's, uh, it's always using its past assets as the superstructure, the foundation for its next expansion. And it grows 10,000 feet down, right? Under pressure, underwater pressure. If you have massive pressure on you from all directions all the time, how should you grow? You should grow like a spiral out, right? Because you don't want to reach beyond your fingertips because you will be smashed or, or broken. And the chambered Nautilus is a, is a stable growth structure under pressure. And mm -hmm. I think we can learn a lot from that when we're thinking about how the industry evolves and how you evolve any particular business or or product or service we all mature right and again uh, success and failure in life gives you humility and you can get perspective on things and so so when you're going through things early on you don't always see them as clearly as as when you've got a little bit of hindsight and a little bit of experience um the world is different today too for example 20 years ago if you got on TV, you got 90 seconds for a soundbite and they cut you off. Journalist gets to interview you and then they get to pick what they're going to say and they get to wrap it with their opinions about what it means. And if they want a quote, they can, enter, they can get a hundred quotes, cherry pick the two quotes that they want, run with that and represent that to be a statistical sample of the world, right? It's kind of skewed against the person being written about or the entity being written about to the benefit of uh, the journalist that, can, that, that has the megaphone, right? Um, I would say today, 20 years later, uh, journalists still have a lot of power, but there's a lot more outlets for information. So, no, so you don't just have two newspapers or three newspapers and two networks to watch. There's a lot of places you get information. And... Um, I would say the arrival of long form interviews like YouTube that get posted on YouTube and, and also short form video on Twitter and then Twitter in general, it means that you have a, a deeper, more multifaceted um, communication channel. I, I think that right now we're just in a situation where a lot of people still aren't focused. I mean, it's still not, they're still not really, there's so much noise and they've got so many other things on their plate that they haven't really focused upon this as an extraordinary engineering breakthrough that's going to change the course of humanity. I don't think that 
I don't think that Paul Tudor Jones or Stanley Druckenmiller or Bill Miller are really focused on it based upon what they've said. They're uh, open to the idea of it ex existing, but it's still in a bucket of it's a it's a financial instrument or a hedge of some sort, but they don't really quite get it. They're not thinking that it's uh, a crypto energy reactor that's going to power a hundred trillion dollars worth of monetary energy. They're not even considering it. They haven't even considered it and dismissed it. See, like mm -hmm. it's not like we disagree. He, it hasn't. It, it just like out there is noise, and somehow we need to get people to focus. And I don't think they're going to start to focus until after you know Bitcoin crosses the all-time highs, and maybe maybe when it's double what it is right now, people may actually stop and give it ten hours, or an hour, or two hours. I, I'm quite sh one of the reasons that I'm an enthusiastic evangelist is I'm quite sure that the criticisms from Honorio Rabini and Ray Dalio and anybody else of Bitcoin, I'm sure that they would reverse those criticisms if they stopped for an hour and watched, say, my video I did with Salt Talks with mm -hmm. uh, Anthony Scaramucci. Because their criticisms are things like, well, it's a currency and it's not good for payments. I can't buy things with it, you know, and the government's going to ban it. And if they, if they understood... It's not a currency. It's not a payment network. When you plug it into PayPal, PayPal becomes the payment network and their compliance rails solve all the compliance KYC AML issues. And now it's a store of value. And by the way, a store of value is appreciating 100% a year on average for the last 10 years. Bing, click. All right, well, so what was your criticism again? Oh, the government's going to ban it. Yeah, you know, like, okay, really? Like the IRS legitimized it. The head of the SEC just said it was a piece of property. The head of the OCC said that banks can custody it. And a senator just said she's going to explain it to Congress. So tell me again what your concern is. No, they haven't really spent an hour. At least they, they haven't got the right information. So if I tweet, I'm not tweeting to convince anybody. I'm tweeting hopefully so that they'll click on that link. And they'll listen an hour. And if they won't click on the link, maybe someone that works for them will watch the link. And by the way, it's like if Ray Dalio never watches that that video, well, there's 10,000 other people like Ray Dalio that compete with Ray Dalio. And so I don't got to convince Ray. <laughs> All I got to convince is anybody that competes with Ray in the world to spend an hour. And I believe that they spend an hour, then they're looking to go, Oh, wow, there's $250 trillion of stuff that's fiat instruments that debasing at 10% a year. There's one thing that's accreting at 100% a year. It's a, it's a solution to the problem that 7.5 billion people have on the planet. Oh, yeah, and by the way, it'll make us billions of dollars. So now it just comes down to a simple estimate of how much of it do I want to own? 1%, 5%, 10%, 50%, 100% of my portfolio. You, got, you know, it's like it's that simple. They're, the problem is they're just not even thinking about it that way yet. And we need to get their attention. And that will come bit by bit. 90% of my effort was focused upon the P&L and the operations of the business. And 10% and was focused upon the balance sheet and corporate matters. But today I would say that Fong is driving the P&L and I would say like 10 to 20% of my time is operated on the P&L and 80% of my time is strategic matters. And it's either, I, I'm either looking at uh, the technology plan, the product plan over the long term, or um, I spend a lot of time with the various executives, the top CXOs of the company, uh, but I'm not, uh, I'm not actually on the critical path of every project, every deal, every, every um, issue like that. So most of my interaction is technology, technology uh, development, technology plans, product design, product strategy, and then corporate matters and managing the balance sheet.
I would say like 20% of my time is communicating something regarding Bitcoin or regarding our corporate strategy. And, and 20% of my time, I guess, is, is stuff that's very operational. And the rest is wherever, strategic issues. For the Bitcoin ecosystem in particular, you know, I'm a brand ambassador for MicroStrategy. I have investor relations and, and I spend time with our investors. And then, and then I'm driving the future of the company, the future of the product line. And I have, I have my fair share of employee interactions. I would say I'm not as hands-on with, re with regard to controlling sales and services this year as last year because Fong has, uh, has moved up to the presidential role and he really runs the operations of the business, sales services, marketing and tech. And that frees me to think longer term strategically about things and to communicate more. Well, I was pretty intense then and I'm pretty intense now and I'm passionate uh, about, about technology and passionate about excellence. And so that hasn't changed. I think that I'm, uh, I'm older, wiser, I have gray hair, and uh, I've got a bit more experience. You know what they say about experience. Experience is what you get when you didn't get what you wanted. So, so I would say I'm more, I'm, I'm more humble today about how we do things. But I'm no less idealistic or passionate about the business. I'm just, I'm just an older, more experienced version of myself. I'm, I'm much more aware of how critical it is to have really talented people to own the mission today. So if it was 20 years ago, I would have thought, well, I've got this brilliant idea and I've got money and we'll be successful because of my brilliant idea and money and let's go do it. A lot of people have ideas. If it's a, if it's a brilliant idea, don't be patting yourself on the back. Ask the next question. Do you have the assets to commercialize this thing? And then the next question is, do you have the people and the executives to commercialize this thing? And the next question is, are they bought in and do they want to do it with all their heart and soul? And if the answer is no to any of those things, right, you have to have uh, the executives and the, and the professionals and the talent and the hearts and souls of the people and that causes you uh, to put a lot of good ideas on the back burner and say, it's a good idea and I love it, but, but we don't have the assets or, or, or we're not ready to do that as a team. And, um, and you're gonna tear the organization apart if you try. And so you gotta check your ego at the door. And as I would say, my, my stoic statement, which I repeat often is just because you can do a thing doesn't mean you should do a thing.